Good evening. Good evening. This is a re-record of uh, last Wednesday's uh, God Corner. We didn't record it the first time, so we're going to record it now. Uh, if you happen to be looking at this, there should be questions already printed for you to look through, and uh, perhaps it will help uh, as we go through this lecture. Uh, I want to thank you for taking some time to come and listen to some of these thoughts uh, that uh, this particular evening is going to be concerned with redemption in the city that Al has given me to address. And I want to start by saying why in my own understanding, we're asking each other to take some time to explore together as Christians how we might better take advantage of where God has placed what I would call the ground zero of this particular congregation on the four corners of law in Charleston, South Carolina. Um, I knew a priest who was known for his excellence in the area of congregational development. And one thing he would always say to any congregation when he was invited to go in is, you know, we can do most anything, but we can't do everything. So what is it in particular about who you are as a congregation and where you are as a congregation that perhaps God can best utilize for the work of the gospel? It's a good question. And I think this year our rector is asking himself and he's asking us to ask ourselves as a church, are we being the best stewards we can be of the specific location in which God has planted this particular church? Can we take a little time here at the beginning of the new year, put our collective spades in the ground, if you will, and kind of dig into this question, just see what turns up, see what we can cultivate. Uh, now, before I go on, let me quickly position this in a larger context. Our current focus on city-centered ministry is not the only game in town. Of course, there's valid ministry to be done anywhere and everywhere by this gifted and active congregation. And certainly the uh, global impact celebration that we have every year and that's ongoing right now dynamically reveals how for the gospel, this parish continues to invest its talents in our homes, the Holy City, in the Hurting Coast, and the Hungering World. Uh, we've already got a lot of ministry balls in the air, and there's no need or intention to abandon any of them. But for this next year, can we shift our focus and put a little more energy and a little more emphasis into our call to be part of God's church in the Holy City of Charleston? And why do we do all this theological teaching on the front end. I mean, what's the plan? Where do we go? What are we going to do? Um, well, there's certainly a few ideas already on the table, um, and we'll speak to you about some of those. So David Richardson perhaps has already uh, done that. Uh, but there's more along these lines uh, coming your way. But for now, it's important for me to say, as clergy, sometimes it's just our job to take time on the front end to make sure that we lay a good, solid theological foundation for why we're wanting to build a ministry before we actually start the construction project. And, and, and let's be honest, uh, foundation work is not necessarily all that exciting. I mean, it's low to the ground visibility, if not downright underground stuff, but if we really want to build something uh, in order to have it sustained and hopefully blessed, we need to make sure on the front end that we're building on rock and not sand. And that's a primary calling for clergy. And so I think that's why these first few Wednesday evenings, we're hoping to lay a little groundwork for what might grow out from there. And as long as I'm trying to do my part in helping lay the right foundation, I want to tack on something for you from C.S. Lewis right now. In book three of Mere Christianity, uh, C.S. Lewis has this to say about lay ministry. People say, says Lewis, the church ought to give us a lead. Now that is true if they mean it in the right way, but false if they mean it in the wrong way. By the church, they ought to mean the whole body of practicing Christians. And when they say that the church should give us a lead, they ought to mean that some Christians, those who happen to have the right talents, should be economists and statesmen, and that all economists and statesmen should be Christians, and that the whole efforts in politics and economics should be directed to 
putting do as you would be done by in action. But of course, when they ask for a lead from the church, most people mean they want the clergy to put out a political program. And Lewis says, that is silly. The clergy are those particular people within the whole church who have been specially trained and set aside to look after what concerns us creatures who are going to live forever. And we're asking them to do quite a different job for which they've not been trained. The job is really on us as laymen. The application of Christian principles, say to trade unionism or education, must come from Christian trade unionists and Christian schoolmasters, just as Christian literature comes from Christian novelists and dramatists, and not from the bench of bishops getting together and trying to write plays and novels in their spare time. I really like that part. You see, perhaps we as clergy are equipped in some ways to help ask some of the right questions, but really the best and most effective responses must come through everyone's gifts, everyone's perspective, uh, everything that we bring corporately to the table. And with that said, as I indicated earlier, uh, I hope you've already got three questions I'd like us to ponder, or I'd like you to ponder after you finish sharing this lecture. But there's one more that, as I wrote this, that uh, came to me that perhaps ends up being the most in question, important question of all, and we'll get to that. Now, my specific subject is about how we might apply this evening the word redemption to the city of Charleston in particular, right where we are located on the four corners of law. And in order to dig into this, Tim Keller, uh, the book Al and I and others are using as sort of springboards uh, into uh, a vision for this and uh, theological underpinnings, all, all that. Keller invites us first to see ourselves biblically as a people and as a church, much like the way God called Israel to be when they were scattered into exile all over the Babylonian empire. This is not a Jerusalem-centered vision that Keller's inviting us to see. Uh, these days, we need to see ourselves perhaps more like we're living in exile. The Israelites were in a foreign culture existing as a countercultural fellowship. And they were like seeds in the wind, and they brought the value of their own cultural fellowship and they invested it into the alien culture where they were scattered and took root. Now, Keller calls both Israel and the church, as the new Israel, a group of resident aliens. They were full-time residents of one country, but their primary allegiance was to another. And that should describe us. As Geoffrey Chaucer said in a 15th century poem, for us, here is not home, here is but wilderness. And can God set a table in the wilderness? That's one of the great uh, questions in Scripture. And of course, the answer in Scripture is, you bet he can. He, he has, uh, he will, and he does even now, uh, even now here in this place. We as a community uh, of resident aliens, you and I, we, we pray over and over, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth in Charleston, at the front doors of St. Michael's, thy will be done here as it is in heaven. We are part of God's city within the city of Charleston. And 300 years ago, God has planted us in the very center of it. Our location is central Charleston, and it's important, and we want to take a closer look at what might that mean. So let's take a fresh biblical look at where God first chose to center the action of his church on the other side of sending the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. Now notice in the book of Acts as a whole where the action is chiefly centered. It's in cities, and why? because cities were centers of power and influence. Pound for pound, that's where the leverage for the gospel was strategically applied, and the influence of these major gathering areas then radiated outward into the rest of the fabric of that society. 
Now, chiefly, Jesus worked in towns and villages, of course, and in Jerusalem, of course. But when he launched his church from Jerusalem, uh, leading Paul, for example, to Athens, which was the intellectual center of the Greco-Roman Empire, Corinth, one of the chief economic centers of the Greco-Roman Empire. Ephesus was considered perhaps the religious center. And then, of course, financially, uh, well, finally, Rome itself, uh, both in terms of military and political uh, center of power. Now, for what it's worth, we happen to be placed in the center of Charleston, South Carolina. So that in mind, let's jump now to the key word for us this evening and then uh, ask what I think, I hope are a few good and relevant questions. My focus tonight is on the word redeem. It's a powerful word. And tonight perhaps we could define it as buying back or restoring through buying back the value of something. And perhaps tonight think of a pawn shop uh, something of value got put into hock and for a cheap return. Now, to go into that pawn shop and get it out of hock and buy it back means you have to offer something of value yourself. In order to redeem something, you have to put your personal value into it. You invest yourself. And if we can envision the reality of our own spiritual lives as something that we've put into hock for a cheap return, then the cross with its self-investment of Jesus shows each of us the, our value to God, how great a value that is. So, okay, redemption is tied in some way to a personal investment. Now, one of my pet phrases that has emerged uh, in ministry over the years for me is, you can't give what you don't have. So the question for each of us as Christians is always, always, always going to be, Ted, okay, what do you have on hand that you can offer by way of an investment in the name of Jesus Christ for his redemptive intentions and with a specific focus on this particular need or that particular relationship or this particular situation or that particular opportunity that just appears to you? I tell you, you don't have it all. And Ted, on your own, you don't have nearly enough. But Ted, what do you have? What do you have in that little basket of your life today? Is it just two fish and a couple of cheap barley loaves like that little boy that was with me on the hillside 2,000 years ago? Do you mind letting me see what I might do with that now in the holy city? And specifically, perhaps right out the front doors of my church that I planted here in the four corners of law, what about it? I'm asking each of us in our small groups, or if you're uh, seeing this in reserve uh, on your own time, explore this question. If we're going to look at extending the action of redemption around the four corners and outward, can you perhaps hear the Lord's voice? Every time you see that delightfully attractive woman in the credit card commercial and hear her ask, what's in your wallet? So with that in mind, let me kind of move to a close with you. Charleston is not New York. Uh, uh, Keller's work is centered out of where his ministry was centered. It was out of New York, and it's great what he says. It, but we're not New York. We're not L.A. We're not Atlanta. And personally, I, I kind of like that. And also, personally, I'm not interested in selling my house in Mount Pleasant and trying to find some spot that I might afford here on the peninsula somewhere. But as a Christian, I can still walk out the front doors of our church and ask the following question that I believe is relevant for all of us to consider. And this is that question I told you was coming. Where is the pain? Where is the pressure of living around here? What's bringing the hurt? When I was a kid, I was always athletic and highly active and always getting banged up and cut up and beat up. And often I'd end up bursting back through uh, the, the 
our back door wailing over the latest tragedy in my life resulting from some kind of hard play. And the question my parents would ask, usually, of course, my mom, was not, what did you do? Although well, sometimes I got asked that. But the question she or dad would usually ask first is, tell me where it hurts. Where does it hurt? I think as we look outside our front doors here at St. Michael's, that's certainly one question we need to be asking. Where does it hurt? Where do you think it hurts? On the four corners, where up and down Broad and Meeting and King, East Bay, Market, the Battery, where do you think it hurts? And then why does it hurt? What are some of the particular causes for the pain, you think? Now, if you don't know, then how are you? How, how are we going to find out? A, a priest friend of mine uh, was, and I imagine he still is, very fond of saying, you know, people don't care what you know until they know that you care. In order for us to uh, come up with some of the right answers about us doing a better job of radiating the life of our Christian community outward into and from the four corners, we need to start asking the right questions first. And I suggest we ponder the one that I was, I was often asked by mom and dad, Ted, tell me where it hurts. And then it's okay, and it's, I think sometimes to ask about or at least try to discern what's, what's the cause or what's prompting the pain? Where's its origin? What's underneath? Once we got the answer to those questions, then I think we can take a better look at what we have within ourselves to respond. We can't give what we don't have. And in any event, we don't have it all. But in the little basket of our lives, each of us has something, even if it's only a little bit of fish and bread. And I can't engage this inventory question of what you've got in your wallet or your basket for you. I need to take a look at my own life but here's something more. I need you to help me take a look, and, and, and you can do the same. Here's the final thought that I want to offer that should point us towards our reflections. One reason being in a Christian community that just knows how to talk to each other is so valuable is that I really don't know all that I can bring to the table unless you help me see, unless you tell me. I have limited self-understanding. You see things that I can't see, good and, and not so good. Or, and you see them uh, in a different context, uh, perhaps a different emphasis. You, you just have a vision that I don't have. So I know I can't take a proper inventory of what the Lord might call me at any time to invest in this or that redemptive opportunity unless I've been in relationship long enough to ask other people to help me see more clearly. You can't give what you don't have, regardless of whether we're trying to answer ministry questions focused around the four corners of law or the four corners of the earth. We can't fully participate with the Lord in his redemptive work unless we have some idea of what's in our wallet, what's in our basket, if any of us ever want to get beyond theory and into effective practice, this is a question we must always be asking and learning not to ask it alone when we ask it. Uh, let us pray. Now, turn you loose. Lord, make uh, the most of who we are. Um, give us eyes to see what we have to offer and the risk of giving you a shot at doing something with it. Uh, give us eyes to see where you would point us, where you would have us distribute your grace and the blessing that you pour into our, <laughs> uh, our little bits of fish and bread. I ask that you uh, touch our hearts and open our eyes and uh, give us a lead, Lord. 
show us first steps and then second steps and help us be better stewards of where you've planted us now and this day and especially this coming year at St. Michael's. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Thanks for uh, catching this a little bit. God bless.